Mona Sabani is a cognitive neuroscientist, researcher, and author. Her research interests include human behavior, consciousness, and spirituality. Her book is titled Proof of Spiritual Phenomena, a neuroscientist's discovery of the ineffable mysteries of the universe. Please see the description for relevant links, recommended books, and timestamps. So Mona, to start us off, can you please tell us the story of how you went from a diehard scientific materialist to an open-minded spiritual seeker? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so I was a, like I say on my website, a diehard yeah. uh, scientific materialist. Yeah. Um, I mean, I was just a traditionally trained neuroscientist. I mean, I guess I still am. Um, and, you know, they teach us in what, like, as we're get, going through your training, mm -hmm. that the kind of the assumption, I guess, in all of science and scientific training is that the universe is uh random it's dead it's meaningless mm -hmm. and that any meaning that we create comes from us from our selves from our brains and then this is especially true in neuroscience because we're so familiar with these kind of psychological biases um and shortcuts that our brains take um like confirmation bias and things like that. So mm -hmm. where you, you know, you look for things to confirm the things you already believe. So we know all these things and we were trained to uh, understand that the brain is a coincidence detector. Like it actually looks for coincidences and it's a storyteller. So it weaves together stories and meaning between everything that comes in. And that's its job is, is, is what they um, tr train us. <laughs> to, yeah. and, I mean, it really is. That is what is what it does. So everything that comes in, through your senses and through your experiences, your brain tries to create a story so that it can understand it. Um, and so by the time you leave graduate school, at least for neuroscience, um, that's your understanding of the world is the universe is dead, random and meaningless. And all the meaning that we feel as humans, it comes from within us and we project it out onto the world. And that's, uh, you know, it kind of um, disenchants the world. And mm. I think when I went into graduate school, I was a little more, I mean, I think anyone who goes into neuroscience, I've learned this on my journey when I began interviewing my colleagues. A lot of us are curious about philosophy, about reality, about the nature of humans, about how all of this fits together. So you come in very curious and in awe of mm -hmm. nature and reality uh, and then by the end of it, in in some ways, it's uh, disenchanted for you, and you feel a little more like oh, okay, it's it's it is a little more mechanical. I would say like you come to understand that these parts they come together, they work mechanistically, and um, and that's how it is. So I was trained in that way, and by the time I left graduate school, you know, you you start thinking in this very, very specific way, like you do start automatically breaking things down into parts, thinking analytically, very, um, uh, from the neuroscience literature, it's, it's very left brain, your left brain is very focused on process and yeah. serial processing and analytics. So it's very much like that. And that's where I was when I graduated and I was doing a postdoc and then I started working in, um, I did a few different things, but the last one, when things started to change, I was working at a digital health center, uh, doing a re I was a research scientist at um, the university of Southern California. And, uh, and then everything changed. <laughs> <laughs> so how did it like start to change? Or I guess before you tell me how it started to change, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. I want to just kind of put a magnifying glass on on you and who you were when you were you know going through college and you said that you were starting to think as they were teaching you to think in this very mechanistic way um what were your thoughts on i guess like you know the nature of reality and meaning and what is life and all of yeah. these kind of big big profound questions what were your thoughts before you went to uni and or, or college and um yeah how would you describe yeah. your your attitude towards that um i wasn't very well, I definitely wasn't religious. I mean, I didn't grow up in a religious household. I think my my mother was spiritual, but um, I wouldn't say that I was. Um, and I think that the when I got to college, though, I do remember. I I think of it now as living in the flow. Like I very I lived very much in the flow of things. Um, so like I had a lot of coincidences and synchronicities happen and to the point where I would document them and my roommates and I would be like, 
marveled at them. And so I lived in a state of like, wow, you know, the universe is so mysterious and cool. And there's, Mm -hmm. it felt magical for lack, you know, of a better word, but some, the thing, the way things would fall into place or um, easily, or like if I found money, I knew I would need it later. Like there was kind of this bit, but it wasn't conscious. I wasn't like, oh, I'm spiritual and I'm living. I didn't think about it at all. It wasn't conscious at all. It was just the way that I lived. It was just the way it was. Um, And then so yeah, it was like that. I think when I went into graduate school too, I started off like that <laughs> much yeah. more uh, just excited and and in mis- uh, awe of the mystery and much more in tune with uh, coincidences and things like that. But then by the end, I think you, you know, your, uh, your focus gets sharpened, your attention gets diverted to your studies, and then you start to get, I say, indoctrinated, um, li- like literally indoctrinated for your doctorate, um, then you change the way that you think and all of that changed. So I wasn't, um, and then I became very, I was actually very anti, I think, I'm trying to remember, I was already anti-religion religion and anti, mostly anti-religion in college. Mm-hmm. Um, and part of that is probably because my parents are from Iran. And so they, we've watched their country of origin be yeah. uh, demolished by a theocracy. So I think that part of it was that. And then I think also 9-11, um, even though, you know, whatever the, the story, the narrative behind 9-11 was that it was uh, ideology driven. And so mm-hmm. anyway, I was pretty anti-religion and not very tolerant of people's religion. I honestly, like I wrote in the book, I said, oh, I thought they were not the brightest people. And part of that is because in science, they do teach you in psychology and neuroscience, they teach you that um, religion and spirituality are coping mechanisms for humans. And so they do teach you kind of teach you that they're like, they, it's like this underlying assumption of reality is already baked into the curriculum of, oh, this is a scientific materialist world. The universe is created of matter. Everything that's physical is real. And, and so based on that, you know, there's, there's no meaning. So any meaning that we create, like I said, is from you, which includes religion and spirituality. And and then it goes to the question of evolutionarily, why would that have evolved? And one of the theories is that it's a coping mechanism because life is hard and humans suffer and they need a a reason. Yeah. And death is scary and they need something. And so I adopted that view just because there was no other view presented to me. So, um, and so, yeah, I think that I, um, oops, I lost my train of thought, but yeah, that that's what, um, that's what they taught us. Oh yes. Yeah, so I was anti-religion and I, I thought it was a coping mechanism. Um, I don't even know that I was that familiar with anything like not religious, but spiritual at that point. Mm-hmm. But if I, yeah. if, if it came to my attention, let's say later in grad school, then I became, um, aggressively anti that too, mostly again, because that's just the, attitude i think in your colleagues and in your environment and you just adopt it and then you mm-hmm. as you go through your training you do like i wrote in the book like i just became very arrogant and thought i knew i didn't think i knew everything but i did think science had all the answers and so um anything that wasn't science based i was like um yeah that's stupid and garbage yeah. and and yeah. so and spirituality and religion were thrown into that so yeah i was pretty aggressively anti like my friends tell me they didn't feel comfortable talking about those things in front of me because I also wasn't quietly um, anti. I was like, (laughs) yeah, I was just not (laughs) very nice about it. So (laughs) yeah, 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 absolutely. And do you think part of it was maybe the way in terms of spirituality now, not so much religion, but for the spirituality, you think that was partly, yeah, the way the media and society kind of portray spirituality because for me before i kind of started going down this road of research and and talking to people like yourself yeah spirituality was just a kind of you know it meant nothing it just meant like you know somebody with a crystal ball at the fairground or somebody (laughs) like trying to do a card trick or Mm -hmm. you know and it was just laughable really the idea because because we're not presented with like oh there is this there's this research in these areas it's just oh yeah spiritual nonsense and mumbo jumbo and all that kind of thing yeah there's um this pervasive belief in western society that that um whole array of beliefs in the paranormal or in the spiritual or the mystical have been investigated and debunked 
And nobody, if you ask them is my, you know, for a citation, nobody can give you one because <laughs> nobody's bothered to look it up. It's just something that we uh, collectively have agreed to believe. And it's um, it's in the media, you know, you hear it all the time. Journalism is supposed to be objective, but when you read things, when you read articles, uh, and I do this all the time, just because I, I love, I love finding it in uh, journalism now. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's funny to me. Um, but it's supposed to be, you know, some objective article on something, but you can tell that there is a, a lean and a bias toward oh, uh, scientific yeah. materialism and just kind of like, oh, well, you know, there's no evidence for this. But um, it, that's because, and this is another one of my my gripes about the way things are, is that journalists are not experts, right? They, they're they experts in journalism, but they're not experts in the fields they write about. And they usually only interview one type of expert, you know, for something like, let's say it's a medical treatment. And then so if they're writing about something that's more, quote unquote, integrative, functional, alternative, uh, complementary medicine, you know, yeah. they don't always go to the right experts. So um, yeah, so I think I, I picked it up from Western culture, media society and then also science yeah yeah well okay um so yeah you were vehemently against uh <laughs> against these kind of yeah thought processes when you were yeah younger and then mm -hmm. something happened you were working at this what like medical center or something you said health center yeah um, a research you were center. doing your yeah you were doing your what your postgraduate your, your postdoctoral I don't, what were you doing? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I did do a postdoc, but that was different. Um, I was just, I had a job as a research scientist. Okay. Doing... So that, that was after, okay. You'd graduated yes. and you were just in the world of work. You were working yeah. at this health center mm -hmm. and things started to change. So what was the first um, chink in the armor? What was the first kind of like a domino? Yeah. Well, and so I should back up actually. I mean, my, mm -hmm. the crack in my armor, I guess, came at that time that we're talking about, but um, it started er a little bit earlier um, because let's see, I think it started at the beginning of graduate school. So my, my mother, we're Persian, as I mentioned. So in our culture, our culture is, is traditionally, like if you go back to ancient per Persia, you know, um, traditional uh, indigenous culture, like we're indigenously Zoroastrian, um, not Muslim. And so in our culture, it is very, you know, if you look to the poetry of Rumi and Hafez, um, it, it is mystical and very spiritual. And so we have some of that, those traditions built into our, um, our traditions. And so my, um, like rituals and things like that. And so my mom and, and my grandmother, one of the things is they um, have a talent for divination so they would use which is like using whatever yeah i was going to ask her just a quick definition just yeah uh, for anybody that is not it, sure it's usually you, you can use any tool um like tarot cards or whatever but in our family we used uh, coffee grounds and it's not american coffee it's a thicker coffee like it's often called turkish or greek or armenian or middle eastern coffee but you drink it in like a small little cup and then the grounds stay in the cup you drink the liquid and then you flip the cup over, let the grounds dry. And then if you have somebody who's a talented intuitive, they can look at the pictures and tell you what they see. And it's 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 intuiting things about your past, present, and your future, but your your life basically. And so my grandmother used to do that. And my mom learned it from her and she would do it at family parties and everyone loved getting readings from my mom. And I didn't even know what, what was going on. I never understood it. But when I was in graduate school and I started going home on the weekends, my mom would make coffee for me and she would just absentmindedly re read the coffee for me. And I remember that I, you know, it was just like a bonding thing and I didn't really take it seriously, but eventually I started noticing that things that she would say would come true and they would be, you know, things again, that were not, she couldn't have known. I couldn't have known. It would be things in the future. So, yeah. um, I started noticing and then I started taking notes because then I was like, wait a minute, you know, and I thought I was being trained whatever as a scientist in grad school. So I was like, oh, this I, I'm probably just doing confirmation or bias or, oh, she must have just picked up. But then they would be things that uh, over time, you know, after I would take notes for a while to see what was going on, I realized I was like, there's no way she could know some of this stuff. There's no way that I would know that things were coming. And um they, you know, there'd be things that I don't even think about. She doesn't think about. So it was, it was so shocking, you know, that um, I, I started realizing that it works. I didn't know how it worked. I didn't have any way to explain it with science. We definitely didn't touch anything like that in our training. So I just ignored it or lived in, 
you know, I guess cognitive dissonance. I didn't really try to explain it to myself at all. Right. And I just lived that way. But um, then when I fast forward back to when I was working, you know, graduated, I was, I was working, I would still uh, go home on the weekends, visit my parents and my mom continued to read for me. <laughs> and so there were two events that really shook me. So like, there were many times when her readings would like chill me to the bone, but right. that weren't life changing. And mm -hmm. I do think this is that thing of where there's like a perfect storm sometimes for these things to happen of where you're open enough and something is shocking enough. Um, and that's what, that's what had to happen. So it's like, I had all these shocking moments with her, but I wasn't open enough or didn't, wasn't ready or didn't need it. Um, but one of them was, uh, we, I had a, like for weeks in advance, she, or for a few weeks in a row, like six weeks, she kept seeing something negative, <laughs> which normally she kind of glosses over or she'll just be like, oh, you know, don't worry about this too much, da, da, da. But this one, she was really herself uh, unsure about it and a little shocked. So she kind of was acting weird and she was saying like, oh, I think I should warn you because I keep seeing it. And she's like, you know, I don't normally like to say things like this, but she's like, I think you're going to get some bad news. And I was like, what do you mean? And, but she wouldn't tell me what it was because she was like, I'm not even sure. She's like, I mean, I know what I'm seeing, but I'm not sure, sure what I'm seeing. And she's like, we'll just see what happens. Um, and then, so I lived in like, and by this point I knew that she was usually right, especially if something came up like a bunch of times in a row, like it usually meant it was going to happen. Um, yeah. And so I was getting like more and more nervous. And I asked my friends, like, I was like, do any of you have bad news that you're not sharing and whatever. And then a few weeks later, finally, I found out one of our professors in our program was killed by one of the students. And it was somebody who um, I'd worked with on one of the experiments in my dissertation. And it was a totally shocking event for our entire community, obviously, because it was so, out it was just outrageous. And it was uh, unexpected uh, as these things are. And mm. I remember I called my mom back and it was, like, I think I know what the event was. And I told her, and then she was like, yeah, it was a death. And I just didn't know. Uh, She's like, it was really unusual. I'd never seen anything like it before. So I didn't want to say anything. Um, But that really shook me because all of the readings before that had been like, you know, silly thing, not silly things, but like things that were important in my life, but that were not life or death. This was life or death. And it yeah. really disturbed me that the information of his death was available in the universe, like ahead of time. And that's yeah. when I started to wonder about, I was like, well, was it his fate? Is there such a thing as fate or destiny? Um, or, you know, is it just that things happen and life your life gets set on a path and then that information comes backwards in time. Um, but, you know, I didn't dig into it because I was busy. I had a new job and I think I was also in grief for a while. So I was like, no, I didn't really dig into it, but it disturbed me. Like, and I wouldn't say like, I wasn't excited and in awe. I, it actually really disturbed me about yeah, the universe. Like it, it scared me. Yeah. I was like, what does yeah. this mean? So I ignored yeah. it. <laughs> and then, um, and then a few years later, I had this relationship that um, my mom had seen coming for months. And then she was like, oh, it'll be good or whatever. And it came and then we broke up. And then, of course, I didn't think that was good. So then I and then that was like the that was the last straw. So I was already already kind of I think maybe maybe it, it started after graduate school, but definitely with that death of that professor, I had sort of started slipping into an existential crisis. <laughs> um, I mean, I definitely don't think that helped that event. And I, you know, I started to wonder like, well, what is the purpose and meaning of life? And is this it? Yeah. We just wake up every morning and go to work. And, and then we, and then we have like our, you know, fate is that we die. I don't know. I just started flipping out in general <laughs> about that kind yeah, of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then, so the relationship ending was like, the last, um, uh, I say, I think of it as like the last leg of a stool that was knocked out. And so then I had my dark night of the soul where I was just like, what is the point of all this? And so I just felt like despair and lost optimism and hope and was in a dark place for a while and then couldn't understand the coffee readings too. I was just like, how does this play into everything? Um, so I was like that for a while. And then, and then that was, that was the 
beginning of the turning point. So then I started to, it was really my girlfriends were like, oh, do you want to go get a psychic reading? (laughs) And I thought, why would I want to do that? No, I don't (laughs) want to do that. (laughs) Um, but they were from LA and they had, they were much more familiar. I mean, I really had, I had never done a reading my, you know, my mom would do readings for me, but it was like someone I trusted. I wasn't paying for it. It was like in my downtime. Um, and you know, again, you pick up from society, this, this general stereotype typed idea about psychics being frauds that they're, that they're reading you. And so I was like, I don't know, but they convinced me and they, uh, one of my friends in particular, she was like, no, I know this lady, she'll turn you away. She's turned her, she turned my friend away twice. Cause she's like, I can't read your energy. So she's like, no, she, she won't take your money if she can't read you. She's honest. Um, so we went and, uh, yeah. And I mean, the lady blew me away. I mean, she knew things, details, like details of like things that were said in private, you know, <laughs> like in some of my relationships and it was just, it, wow. And she was on a number of issues. She had so many variables, right? And they weren't generic variables that I was just, you know, I was blown away. I was like, statistically, the odds of this are just really, I was like, this is, there's just no way she's guessing. So I'm guessing you didn't serve it all to her on a plate either. I'm guessing because of your state of mind, you kind of kept yourself pretty contained and didn't give away too much and things like that. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Especially at that, at that time, I was um, really armored and very like, Mm you know, kept people out and, um, it tried not to give a lot of information away. I mean, we never, I think they, she only knew my first name, uh, cause you would just go in and you never gave information beforehand or anything. So, I mean, you know, people always try to debunk it. So it's, it is what it is, but the, um, but my friends and I actually were like, let's just see, it was just for fun. I mean, I was not in a fun time in my life, but, <laughs> but the activity, with them was fun. We're like, let's swap readings. Let's come back um, a few months, see what ha- what happens, like what they said came true. And then let's go to the same one and, and go, let's go to different ones and let's swap. So we did this for, you That's know, like cool. a, a year. Yeah. To kind of just get a sense of like, cause we didn't know, and we didn't have any, um, nothing invested in it. So we were mm-hmm. like, we'll just see. And, but yeah. yeah, over the, over the course of that, we all realized most of us anyway, we all realized that the the things that they said to each of us were very specific to each of us uh, and that we couldn't swap readings. They were all very specific to each of us and there's just no way. And we would record them. We would take notes. uh, We'd re-listen. So it was, yeah, it was interesting. So I was just like, oh, there's something there. How interesting. Um, But that's it. I was still in a dark place and I didn't really do anything else with that. And then I think the next nudge came when I was driving to see a friend and I was listening to Chelsea Handler's podcast. Uh, She had written a book called Life Will Be the Death of Me, uh, which uh, was very speaking to me at the moment. And so I read the book and she then I was like, oh, I got to listen to her podcast. This is great. So I listened to her podcast and she was a skeptic um, and she was like anti-therapy even. She was like anti-spirituality, anti-everything. Um. But I listened to her podcast because it was just like six episodes at the time. And one of them was, and I was mostly listening because she had her psychi- her psychiatrist actually works with my one of my dissertation advisors. So I was interested in um, that connection and they were talking about the Enneagram and therapy. But then one of her episodes was with a psychic medium, uh, Laura Lynn Jackson. And so oh, I, yeah. yeah, and I was like, wait, so... Yeah, this she had this episode, and I remember being surprised, like, oh, she's such a skeptic. Oh, this is crazy. She has a psychic medium on. So I listened to the episode, and then uh, Laura Lynn Jackson does this beautiful job on the episode, uh, explaining to her, explaining how she reads people, how she sees things and understands things. Um, and I was interested in that from a neuroscience perspective of like, okay, if let's say this is true, let's say they can get information or read people then i was curious about how it happens for them and i was like when you say you're seeing something are you seeing it with your eyes are you seeing it in your imagination um you know like do you when they would sometimes they would say things like oh i feel and they would like grab a body part so i wanted to know like do you actually feel it so she talked about that a little bit and i thought it was so she said she had done um sign worked with scientists to let them record her uh brainwave activity which of course i was interested in (laughs) um and then she described the spiritual framework of 
like, oh, we come back to earth to learn lessons. We're souls. We have um, soul groups like reincarnation, da, da, da. And that caught my attention because I didn't realize it until I heard that. But a lot of the, all of the intuitives and psychics I had seen with my friends had said the same thing. But when they said it, it went over my head because I had never been exposed to that kind of spirituality. So I was like, it just went over my head. I was just like, okay, whatever. And I wrote it down, but I didn't know what any of it meant. So when Laurel and Jackson started talking about it, I perked up and I was like, oh, maybe this will, uh, let me be able to understand better what the intuitives I had seen had meant. Like maybe some of what they said to me will make more sense, which it did actually (laughs) when she explained the framework and I understood it. Um, but then I got curious about like, do they all go to like psychic school? Like, why do they all sign up for this spiritual framework and not something else? Um, and I didn't know reincarnation was, I mean, I thought it was just from, uh, you know, like Buddhism or Taoism or whatever. I didn't yeah. know that it was, it could be in any other kind of spiritual framework. And, um, and then she, the last thing was on that episode, they mentioned a book by uh, Brian, Dr. Brian Weiss called mm-hmm. many lives, many masters. And it, she said it was, he was a psychiatrist. So I ordered it and I didn't know what the book was about. And that was the book. That book was the ultimate flipping point. Cause uh, when it arrived, I thought I was reading, well, it is a case study from a psychiatrist, but it's about past life regression, which I didn't know what that was either. Um, so as I was reading it, I was like, what am I reading? <laughs> <laughs> and what yeah. is this? But he, but Brian Weiss was like this, you know, well-credentialed Yale and Columbia educated psychiatrist. And he talks in the book about how he was not into anything paranormal. He was an atheist. Um, and he was... You know, so he was coming from a place where I was coming from. So it was interesting to read the book and see where he ended up. Right. And then I, mm. I ordered all of his books and read them all because I was curious. Can you pardon? Is there there's like some noise in the background? I hope you can't hear it. Sorry. <laughs> I I heard it, but I don't think it's gonna be like okay, uh, loud yeah. on the, the final product or anything. Construction across the street. So um oh, okay. there's like trucks. Uh anyway. So Yes, they, so I was like, this is interesting. So I bought all his books and then I thought, well, maybe it's just him. But then I looked into the field and there were a lot of others. And what was really interesting is when they would regress these patients, not only would they heal some of their fears and anxieties that nothing else could heal, but when they would go into this in-between state, they would start describing the same exact spiritual framework that the intuitives described. And a lot of these, uh, case reports were from like the seventies or eighties. So it's not like there was an internet, you know, it's not like it wasn't very popular. Um, And there were so many, I mean, there was so so much like thousands of patients per each of these psychiatrists and they would, you know, after their careers, they would write books summarizing everything and saying like, we, you know, like just like Brian Weiss, I was a skeptic, but (laughs) after seeing thousands of patients, like no matter what, this is a phenomenon. This is strange that if you put someone in a regress straight, regress relaxed state and ask them to describe, you know, what, what's being told to them or what they see, they all say, oh, I'm like choosing my family to incarnate. And (laughs) these are the soul lessons I've chosen for this life. And so that fascinated me. And then that's what kicked it off is the kind of like, let me look into this. Let me read about it journey. Yeah. And so that was the moment where it was like the, all the, you know, the, the, I, don't, well, I can't find my words, the little, you know, the training wheels on a bicycle, all that was gone. And you were just, you, you were unleashed. Is that, is that right? Of. I mean, I didn't believe anything yet. I was just exploring. I was just curious. Yeah. And it's yeah. funny because at times I wanted to believe, but then at other times I just couldn't, I just didn't mm. believe. Like yeah. I just, yeah. um, I just, yeah, it just, it didn't sink in for a very long time. I know what you mean. Yeah. I definitely know what you mean. Like I, I've gone deep into a lot of this research now and like, I still feel weird about using the word belief in it a lot of mm-hmm. it because a lot of it, I think we're just simply following the evidence. Right. But then at the same time, as much as I'm convinced of the reality of some of it, I'd, I'm not a hundred percent sure if I've actually processed some of it yet. You know, if it's still, you know, waiting in a queue in my brain to be like <laughs> dealt with, like, <laughs> yeah. cause I don't know. I feel like, yeah, I just feel like some of it is so monumental and so paradigm shattering compared to yeah. everything that, you know, I grew up with and, and mm-hmm. I grew up thinking that it's, yeah, it's kind of hard to really, to let it sink in fully, I guess. It is very hard. Yeah. And yeah. Um, it just, it is. And you, like, I would be sitting in my room reading it or I would have had 
you know, read, I don't know how many books at that point, and it became more and more familiar and comfortable in my mind. But Mm. whenever I would go to discuss it with someone, then I was immediately confronted with how strange (laughs) it is for our culture. Um, But I, I did buy the book for a bunch of my friends and send it to them. And I made all of them read it because I was like, I wanted to see if it would have the same effect on them. But like I said, for, I think it's a perfect storm. Like some people are just, they'll be like, oh, that was interesting. And then they throw it over their shoulders and move on with their lives. Um, And then for other people, you know, they they were like, you know, really shook by it or or resonated with them in some way that, you know, because they've had prior exposure or who knows, it was different for everyone. So that Mm. was, that was sort of the beginning though. Yeah. That's cool. There's so many bits in there that I want to pick up on and, and ask you about. I've I've made a few notes. So first, I mean, Laura Lynn Jackson, that's that's so cool. She was kind of the first, I guess, medium that made me go like, oh, maybe mm. there is something there. You know, I think it, it was on Netflix on the Surviving oh, Death, yes, the adaption right. from Leslie Kane's book. I watched that and I wasn't very convinced by the mediumship episodes and I'm watching and and then there was Laura Lynn's bit and I'm like, uh, she does seem kind of kind of legit though and then yeah. i read leslie's book and then i'm like wow and then i you know the windbridge studies and laura mm-hmm. lynn as far as i'm aware she's like she seems like the best medium alive today right now really she's um have you ever had good. a reading from her you ever i've sat not with her? but i would love to if she's listening yeah <laughs> <laughs> me, me too <laughs> yeah me too i think she had waiting list is probably like a decade long at it this is point or it's, something. yeah i don't think she even takes new clients anymore i de- i definitely checked when i uh, heard that interview but that was a few years ago yeah. but yeah she's only gotten yeah. more bigger since then so <laughs> yeah definitely um but no she she's incredible like there's so many amazing first-hand accounts out there from like leslie for example leslie kane but then so many other people and as i, as I said the mediumship uh medium uh, studies double blind uh, quadruple blind or whatever they are yes. um yeah. but that's so cool fate and destiny um, I wanted to mention that as well. You were kind of saying, you, you know, when you were questioning things, you, you were questioning, is there fate? Is there destiny? After the death of your uh, professor, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, did you ever, you know, did you ever come to it? Obviously not a definitive conclusion, but what, like, what's your gut on that now? Like, because that's something that's really interesting to think about. I don't often consider it really, the idea of, of fate, but you're right that with, with precognition and people saying, oh, th- this person, well, somebody's going to die and then somebody dies or you're going to move to this city and then or yeah. so-and-so yeah. is going to move and this is going to happen in their life and then it happens. Like that does raise the question of fate, even though, yeah, yeah it's weird. Uh, yeah. It? <laughs> um, yeah, and that was really one of the driving questions that I kept asking the intuitives, but I, um, and so I think interestingly, the, well, I could just tell you what I think now, but it's based on, um, so Brian Weiss addresses it in his book and I'm just going to use his example, but because it's been, um, it's what a lot of other people say. So it, the idea is that they're basically, uh, your soul allegedly <laughs> comes to incarnate with like kind of a, a general plan, not like mm-hmm. a day by day, minute by minute plan, but like a general, like uh, points in your destiny points, I think is what he calls them destiny points in your life. And that you have, but you have free will and that the free will kind of, you know, is like the day to day. I mean, actually it's, it's everything. So even if you get to a destiny point, you can, you can always choose which way to go. Um, but I think the destiny points are bigger, like consequential points. Mm. So Mm. my understanding is that there isn't like one, plan that like everything is destined but yeah. that uh you have options <laughs> but there are certain things that i guess your your soul wants to do and i think when you get to those destiny points it is kind of like um that's when it is more like listen to your heart like what is your you know kind of what is your heart driving you towards and um the one that it wants i guess is like what your soul had hoped and planned for <laughs> and so yeah. That's kind of my understanding, but it is it is confusing because I do remember this when I would get readings, they would say things like, oh, well, you know, just manifest. And I would be like, what? <laughs> like, what? <laughs> um, what now? And, but they would say things like, this is going to happen. This is going to happen. This is going to happen. Then they'd be like, oh, yeah. but, but go ahead and manifest. And I'm like, I don't understand. <laughs> if you're telling me that these things are going to happen, then how can I manifest? And 
how do I manage, you know? And so it took me a long time to understand um, that. Um, and that's why I had, did so much reading and had to constantly talk to them. But it's hard for them to explain. It's hard to understand. Um, but that's how I've come to understand it. It's like there's, there's points where um, I think to some point, actually, this is also how I think about it. Like they, they say that you can, in theory, manifest anything you want, but um, you do come with quote unquote karmic stuff. So mm -hmm. that based on that, and I kind of think of it like an algorithm actually, just because that's how I'm trained, is that there's like weights on things for you based on your karma. And so that certain things would be easier to move than others based on what you came in with. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, yeah, it's really interesting the 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 whole the whole idea behind that the whole thought of it. Um, as well, I wanted to talk to you a little bit more about the the past life regressions because you mentioned that in in some detail. Um, I'm very familiar with like uh, the work at DOPS in terms of the the re like you know children with past life memories. Yeah. And I, I've spoken to Jim on this podcast. I've read his mm -hmm. books, and I'm, I'm very familiar with that. Less familiar with past life regressions. I'm obviously aware of of it's something that happens, and but I, I again I understand that it's maybe less ever evidential in a sense because of the hypno hypnotizing elements and things like that yeah. i don't know if that that's always but, but again what are your thoughts on it in general and have you ever had any past life regression sessions and and did they go anywhere yeah um yes so past life regression is not clinically studied <laughs> right um i mean yeah. like in science and medicine if you want to validate a therapy a therapeutic or something you do these double blind clinical trials but um you know it's it's already done somewhat less already in therapeutic settings like you have to have i don't know how to explain it but like you have to have um we have to have uh like the american psychological association behind it you have to have the american psychiatric association behind it you have to have it funded um and then you have yeah. to ha you know do these trials so um you know none of that has been done at least to my knowledge for past life regression i think but um there is like journal uh that a uh, kind of more academic one that publishes on the topic and i did there were a few practitioners that tried to take like um you know uh, statistics and keep track of things to to validate it in some way. So generally what I can say is that it's not very good at, like you shouldn't go into a past life regression hoping to prove reincarnation, okay? Like that's, it's not very good for that just because of the nature no. of it. I think a lot of the practitioners think that it's like 50% maybe accurate past life stuff and maybe 50% your imagination, but it doesn't matter. You still get the therapy, therapy you need. So basically your mind and body, which in, in psychedelic and plant medicines, there's this idea that your body is the healer and it knows how to heal itself. And, you know, it, in Western medicine, we have this, no, we need to know the mechanism. I need to know the pathway. I need to know the structure of the chemical. But if you step back into more holistic natural medicines, it's more like the whole, whole heals itself. Your body knows how to heal itself. Your body might know how yeah. to heal itself. You just have to get out of the way. And so past life regression is sort of like that, that um, we may not understand the mechanism. We may not know if it's hundred percent a past life or not, but if you're just looking for some therapeutic effect, it, it is as effective as cognitive behavioral therapy as, um, as a lot of other um, types of behavioral health ther therapies that are used. So, and part of that is, just that any modality is as effective as each other. So it's like placebo is also 40 to 60% effective, cognitive behavioral therapy, yeah. um, acceptance and commitment therapy, past life regression, they're all almost as equally effective. So if you if you just wanna know if it's effective for for healing, it is. <laughs> if you yeah, wanna know, if, it, if you wanna use it for, um, to prove past life stuff, that's harder because we don't, yeah. we don't know, it's hard to, it's hard to. But I do know there's also been, when I was looking into the research, um, there were anecdotal cases, but very good ones. And Brian Weiss talks about them in his in his book. So sometimes there would be like two people that do not know each other that both happen to be Weiss's patients or any of the other practitioners, and they would describe the exact same past right. life down <laughs> to the details. And then he would realize like, oh, and he and he, I remember him saying it in one of them, and he's like, you can't betray you know, doctor patient confidentiality. He's like, but it would be crazy. Like these two 
um, he's like, I would just watch these two people pass each other in the waiting room, knowing that they had this past life together, not being able to say anything. So there would be things like that. Uh, he had a lot of cases like that. And so did um, Roger Wolger is another one and Michael Newton. Um, and then also they would oftentimes patients would describe things, um, you know, like the details about the life, uh, like. I don't know, like if in medieval Europe, they would use this tool and they would know the name of it. And it would be some like obscure tool that no one's ever heard of, or it's not common knowledge. So a lot yeah. of things like that would happen where it's like, it's not reasonable to assume that the patient would have that knowledge. Like if they were just like a, a construction worker who's not interested in history, like how would they know that? And then the criticism against that um, is usually that, oh, they probably heard it somewhere. Their subconscious picked it up. And, and so nobody can, and we can't disprove that. Um, so yeah. that's why it's hard to prove or disprove, uh, that kind of thing. But mm. anecdotally, there's a lot of stuff like that, where it's like, there's no way that they would know the name of this random Southern city, you know, in like, I don't know, in yeah. the American South, if they're from Europe, some, stuff like that. Or a poem in a random dialect right. uh, of like, yeah, exactly. archaic Chinese or something. I, oh, what I think that say? was, yeah. Sometimes they would also start speaking in another language that they don't know fluently. Yeah. Um, yeah. And there's a lot of, um, there's some cases like that in normal neuroscience, which con confound us too. Like you'll mm. have cases where people have a head injury and then they spontaneously start speaking another language fluently that they've never been exposed to. And we have no way of explaining yeah. that. So what do you think about, this is just like, I'm kind of jumping across here. I did want to ask you if you've ever done any past life regressions, oh, yeah. but you just, we'll come back to that. So for now, I just wanted to get, yeah, savant syndrome. What is your take on savant syndrome? You, you must be aware of the work of Diane Hennessy, Dr. Diane Hennessy. Right. Um, yeah. Savants are interesting. I mean, in neuroscience, we don't, again, don't have an explanation for yeah. them. I talk about this briefly in my book. Like there's a few things, like I said, like when you have brain injury, sometimes you have these spontaneous abilities emerge, like I mentioned, being able to speak a language that you've never been exposed to, or suddenly being proficient at a high level math, or suddenly having a, a musical ability. And it's the same with savants, like they are born with skills that they, you know, our basic assumption in theory in neuroscience is that you learn everything through experience, and you learn through your five yeah. senses. So the fact that savants can be born with knowledge that they couldn't have reasonably acquired like in the short amount of time that they've been alive, like to the level that they've acquired it. Um, yeah. We have no, uh, no explanation for usually neuroscience will just say, Oh, it's um, neuroplasticity, which means the brain is amazing and mysterious and we don't know how it works. Um, yeah. I, you know, I mean, I don't know. I, I, I think that I lean towards that consciousness is probably not produced by our brain the way that we think it is in mainstream neuroscience um, based on yeah. all of the classes of evidence like near-death experiences, passive regression, reincarnation, psychic phenomena, like so many things that it's probably not bound to our minds and mm -hmm. that we probably don't understand the interaction interface between our brains and consciousness um, and that savants um, and other cases like that are just part of that that we just yeah. don't understand how they could have these skills and um yeah <laughs> Yeah, and abilities and mm -hmm. yeah, knowledge and it's yeah, it's it's wild stuff. Um, but really fascinating. So yeah, a, a normal, you know, um, what was the term we used earlier? A hardcore scientific materialist. Yeah. If a neuroscientist like that, they're going to say it's neuroplasticity and the law of large numbers or something along those lines, right? Yeah, it's, uh, they would. Just the amazing brain and lots of people alive to be bound to have extreme outliers or something like that. Right. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. But yeah, yeah, it doesn't make sense. <laughs> really <laughs> no 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 it's it, no it doesn't I, th I think what you said seems uh, yeah a lot more accurate potentially some kind of yeah like download or from you know like a universal consciousness or something like that um tapping into this very i mean maybe some kind of glitch in a way like getting loads of information that you weren't necessarily supposed to have just right. just happened i yeah. don't know how the how how all this works is way beyond me you know we like don't that. no one and, knows <laughs> no there's so much bizarre stuff going on in nature um so yeah to go back to your the regressions so mm -hmm. have you ever had a regression have you ever been regressed yeah i had three regressions um I'm like, I should do more, but they're actually very emotional. <laughs> they're like really? really crazy emotional. Um, So 
yeah, I, I think I did three of them. I wrote about one of them in the book and it surprised me. So I had been in psychotherapy for like a year before I tried um, past life regression and psychotherapy is like fine. You know, it's like good to get stuff off your chest. Um, but mm -hmm. the past life regression. And so I meditate a lot and I'm a very good visualizer. So I have a very active, um, you know, and some people don't. So, um, but I do. So it was easy for me to regress. And I remember thinking it wasn't going to work at all. And I actually remember when my uh, therapist was counting down from 10, I started getting really nervous. Like they do this like yeah. final countdown. And I was like, it's not going to work. It's not going to work. <laughs> and like, um, but as soon as she did, and she just said, oh, what do you see? And then I just started seeing stuff. And so I just started telling wow. her um, what I was seeing. And it was just kind of unfolding in front of my eyes and she would ask questions and and just she and she didn't direct it she would just say what are you saying like basically um and i would i told this whole story of it was like this irish like i had the sense it was like in the 1800s in ireland and i had a farm and like my parents had died when i was young like 14 or something i don't remember the details anymore but something like that and then i got married and then um Anyway, we went through the whole life and I think the thing of the life was that I was closed. My heart was closed after my parents died because I didn't want to hurt anymore. So I never mm -hmm. um, opened my heart fully to like my husband and my kids. And, and then, so when you die at, you die, whatever, you go through the whole life and then you go to the space after in the regression where you're like, with i don't know you're some in between space and she, my therapist was like oh we're gonna call for so the, the, the therapist tries to take you there and you're is that what you're saying like she tries to say oh, so you after you died you went well she's like you well so you yeah you describe the scene of the death or whatever and it is kind of like yeah. you're looking down on the body and then she's like okay go i think i remember actually you know honestly i can't remember how it happened but suddenly you're in the space Maybe she didn't even say space. Maybe she just said, oh, okay, now we're going to meet individually with um, some of the souls in that life. That's And then that's what happened. So then she's like, okay, your husband's in front of you. And I think she said, whoa, she said, what are you saying to him? Something like that. And then I just started yeah. saying, for, and I remember thinking, like, it's funny, your conscious mind is like, I don't know what I'm, what, and then suddenly my <laughs> mouth started just saying something and wow. I was like, what yeah. am I, and so I started saying something and then I started crying, like weeping, like actually weeping. And I, it was the kind of, um, you know, when you're like sad and emotional or emo and you listen to music and you make yourself cry, it wasn't like that. It was like deep from my stomach. Like, um, I think I've only cried like that twice before in my life where I got really bad news and my brain didn't have time to process it, but my body started reacting to it emotionally. So it was that it was like, consciously, I didn't know what the, what the hell was going on. Cause I was like, this was a silly regression. Like what is happening? But my body was like weeping. Like I was crying wow. so hard. Um, and I couldn't stop. And so it was very emotional. And then with each of the people she'd be like oh your parents are here and your kids are here and I would just kind of not stop weeping like it was just over I've never I mean really that's why it's like I can't do them all the time because yeah. they're so yeah. emotional and each of the other ones I've had were that emotional too like I don't know why it's just like this huge and that's what they kept saying in the books that I was reading so it was nice to see that it was valid but it's like the um when you're put into an altered state of consciousness or which is a, a regressed hypno hypnotic state is is that your conscious mind sort of which is the one that is normally trying to be like no no we're fine no pain here nothing to see is yeah. kind of put to sleep and your subconscious mind which holds all your <laughs> pain and trauma is op <laughs> is open and so suddenly it's like oh my god we have an opportunity to finally release all this emotional energy that we don't need and it just pours it out and so and that's what happens with psychedelics and any kind of um thing any kind of altered state that uh it it kind of dampens the conscious and opens the subconscious and, and you have this huge emotional catharsis. And I, I was excited because they kept talking about that in all of the past life regression books. And they were all, you know, like PhD trained um, psychiatrists yeah. and psychologists. And so they were like, that's the goal of even psychotherapy is emotional catharsis um, is insights 
into behavior and emotional catharsis. And they're like, so past life regression, that's why it's therapeutic and it actually works is because it allows a uh, release of those emotions. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's awesome. Um, I have a few different follow-up questions based on all that then. So you said you've done it three times. Was it three different lives potentially that you yeah. regressed or was it like, yeah. Okay. So it was a different kind of life each time as it were. Yes. And I suppose that's just, that just happened. I, I guess the, the, the regret, the therapist didn't say now think of it, you know, think of a different life or don't think of that one before. Like it, it no, just she, happened yeah. the way it happened, I guess. I think she, um, oh, you can choose an, you can, I think you can choose an issue or a person beforehand okay. or which I think is what I did. You can just see what comes up. And like mm -hmm. I said, in a lot of these fields, um, it's assumed uh, your, your body and your mind is innate knowledge and wisdom is kind of deferred to like your body and your mind have a wisdom of their own. They know what you need. So you can defer to them and say, well, I will, you know, let my, whatever comes up is what I need to address. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, and you said you, obviously you've, you've made it clear how emotional that was at the time. Do you feel now when you're just talking about it and telling me, do you, do, you're going back there in your mind, do you feel any emotion kind of like uh, pushing on you? Do you feel like, does it feel a bit raw or is it like, not like that now? Like when you look back, it's fine to talk about it. It doesn't phase you. No, yeah, it's fine now. <laughs> <laughs> but do you do you still like do you see what i mean do you still feel attached to that emotion like does it because you know if you think about you know if somebody passes away and and a few months yeah. later somebody says oh tell me about that person you're going to start to feel you know or tell me about the funeral you're going to you're going to you yeah know, Af so, is it after, like that or not? soon after those regressions which were quite a while ago now for me um Af soon after those yes it was still emotional when i would tell people about it mm. and that was good like it was just continuing to release those emotions um i mean now it's been a while so now it's it's not but yeah okay. right after it would it would and also the emotional intensity varied between mm -hmm. the lives i would say yeah, yeah. Yeah. somewhere oh, i guess that we could speculate about whether that's down to like the therapist your mood on the day or um like the life in question i guess yeah, right like they were they were uh, it was the same therapist for the all same of them therapist okay me. i was gonna yeah. yeah but um yeah I mean, the weather what's, what's, on the day that you had oh yeah completely i mean your mind state <laughs> all of that um yeah. i remember on the i remember on the last one that i did i was i was already like oh, am i am i Am I ready for this deep emotional <laughs> catharsis that I know is about to happen? Like, I remember being a little resistant wow. to that last yeah. one because I was like, uh, because it's yeah. a lot, it's heavy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. But you feel like ultimately it kind of healed some, some wounds, maybe wounds that you didn't know you had. It, it helped you. Like, how, how do you feel yeah, it changed? What's you? interesting is that, okay, here's, yeah, here's my take on it. So mm -hmm. I think that, um, I've come to learn through all of not only the spiritual stuff, but like reading about past life regression, I got really into psychedelic medicine. Like I read that literature a lot. So um, what I've learned is that, you know, in psychoanalysis and psychodynamic therapy, a lot of it is understanding like that, you know, analytically and logically understanding your behavioral patterns um, and consciously trying to change them. But even from neuroscience, we know that a lot of stuff is subconscious. It's learned when you're young. Um, a lot of these things are, you, you do just have to break your, emo your emotional and your nervous patterns, your, you know, like your literally your networks. Um, yeah. but you don't have to actually consciously logically understand it. Um, and these are just different uh, schools of thought. So, um, I, I, I think what's nice about past life regression is you take away lessons. So like, she'll also ask at the end, like, what was the lesson of the life? And I remember like the first one was don't close your heart, uh, you know, keep your heart open because uh, otherwise you'll miss out on, you know, love and yeah. uh, a full life. The, All that comes with it. Yeah, yeah. The second one I remember it was a life filled with tragedy, but I remember that I was like happy constantly in it and i interesting and at the end of the regression my therapist was like oh what was the lesson and i was like really like begrudgingly i was like happiness is a choice wow. <laughs> and she was like that's right and i was like i don't know how if i could do that in this life but yeah <laughs> um and i 
I don't even remember the third one's lesson, but so, I mean, those, those lessons are interesting because, because yeah. it's, it's not logical. It's experiential. So you experience it in that life. Like I can still remember what it felt like to be happy in that second life, despite the challenges. And so you're suddenly yeah. like, oh my God, it really is possible. And like, even though logically I cannot understand that, or like in this life, I'll be like, okay, I'll try to embody that, but it's hard. <laughs> um, yeah. But it's interesting because you've experienced it. Um, so I would say that, that you do get these lessons that you, you experience it in your mind and anything you experience in your mind is, is real. I mean, your brain doesn't know the yeah. difference between real and not real. So, um, you experience it. And so you learn a new way of living. And then the second thing is, um, the emotional catharsis is just like relieving <laughs> physiologically. So I don't think you know, again, it's not, I don't think about it. Like I don't sit and analyze it. I just am like grateful to have had yeah. an emotional release kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. That's cool. And I guess with the, the lessons, like you said, the, the kind of, yeah, the, the life lessons, even like if you're super, super skeptical and, and like, don't believe any of this stuff, like that's still your brain telling you that's that mm -hmm. stuff so it's still kind of getting a a, a life lesson or a, a life you know advice oh yeah from yes. your subconscious even even if it was you know if, if if it's not anything to do with past lives or anything yeah. like that on some level it's still yeah not your conscious awareness it's another part oh of your, yeah absolutely your being, yeah and you don't um, have so that's kind of cool you don't have to believe in any of the spiritual stuff at all um you don't yeah you don't have to believe it's a past life you just have to trust that your mind and body know what you need mm. and that it knows how to heal you yeah and i think maybe the last question about about this for now is going to be like in dreams has has any of have you ever had any glimpses of these past lives for example in, in your dreams you know i really i have not i really wanted to <laughs> i really <Yeah. laughs> i've always wanted to do but i haven't had any past past lives i mean i've had a lot of weird dreams like other lives like i'm always i have mm. weird vivid dreams in other places but i don't know if they're i have no I'm, it's not obvious i guess to me that it's like a mm -hmm. past life thing yeah yeah but you had some that you think could have been like you said other lives do you mean were they kind of like dreams set in the present <laughs> if as it were um, well you know how I, dreams are they're so weird um but yeah i'll have <laughs> yeah. dreams about like surrounded by people i don't know and you know, I don't know what I'll be doing. Like I had one of those last week and I just remember actually just as a neuroscientist, I was like, it's so weird that your brain like creates people <laughs> you don't yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like I was like, I didn't know a single person in that dream. <laughs> like, what is that? Um, yeah. So yeah, that is weird. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't, I don't know how it's the dreams are fascinating. I, I, I have had precognitive dreams a lot. I've had a lot of cool. those, but um what about lucid dreams? I can, yeah, I have lucid dreams. I've always lucid. You can do it at will, can you? Mm -hmm. You were going to say, wow, yeah, wow. I a lot of people are going to be jealous about that. I, yeah, that's so funny. I didn't know that, I didn't know that not everyone could do it. Um, yeah, my part, my, my partner's brother is exactly the same. We we spoke to him about it. We're like, oh, did you know about lucid dreaming? He's like, what's that? And we told him and, and he's like, oh, I've just been able to do that most of my life. Yeah, I, I, I didn't even know what it was called. Actually, one of the psychics, one of the first times I went to a psychic, she said that. And she was like, you really... lucid dream. She's like, did you know not everyone can do that? And I was like, what's a lucid dream? <laughs> <laughs> wow. it's just like you can control your dreams and i was like oh yeah like not everyone can do that i didn't know that um <laughs> and, yeah but i can so cool. and it's gotten yeah easier actually now but um yeah so do you have any tips for anyone or is it just so i don't you know innate you just yeah it's just, just innate just i just uh, yeah i have no idea i just happen <laughs> it happens yeah it, it, it happens a lot when I am getting annoyed with the dream and where it's going. Mm -hmm. And suddenly okay. I'll just be like, nope. And I'll just change it and I'll change wow. something about it. And I'll be like, I'm done here. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. Have you tried to kind of see what you can do with it? Like with the, the potential, like, um, for example, like if you tried meditating in a lucid dream or if you tried practicing something that you do in waking life in your dream or um, um uh, like there's loads of other things as well. It, what should I do? I don't know. I've never thought about it. 
<laughs> I guess what you should do, and I'm going to sell you on something here. You should listen to my conversation with Robert Wagner. Um, okay. He's a lucid dream like expert. I, obviously, you don't actually have to do that. There's loads of things no, you I can do. Um, but one of the things he does in his lucid dreams is he meditates. He like goes deep. So like he's oh. meditating within a lucid dream. So he's okay. dreaming. He's like yeah, sitting there, and he does things as well where he will ask his you know his his whatever his consciousness his soul his his higher self i think he calls it um like so anything but like just for example like higher self like what do i need to know mm. uh, or what's the what's my most um you know like emotionally heavy memory or or what's something that i should be aware of this year okay. or you know there's plenty of things um and and he, he he tells these stories and he gets these like crazy responses back and Whoa. um Okay. Yeah, there's there's so much you can do with it, really. Like, I'd really love to be able to to do it, like you know, at will, as it were. Um, oh, do you try? One of those... Do you do those? Methods? I've tried not like I haven't committed to it. I, I'll be honest. Like, I haven't like I haven't really done enough. I I'd occasionally, you know, do a couple of little techniques, mm -hmm. but. Yeah, I haven't really given it a proper go. I can't say I've exhausted all the techniques. Not even close. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I'll look into that. Yeah, I'll, if I think of anything else, I'll let you know as well. Because you should, yeah, you should try and harness that. Because obviously, it's not like um, it's not like doing something when we're awake and we're like, ah, oh, I just have so many other commitments and no right. time. Like, yeah, you, you got to sleep, right? So yeah, it's, yeah, it is freer, much more free in there. So yeah, yeah, and apparently, yeah, like um, like surgeons, like I. I can practice surgery in the lucid dream and you can musicians can practice you know playing instruments and yeah. things like that and there's there's a lot yeah okay i should i mean it has crossed my mind i just healing. haven't healing oh, as well yes. he said he's had a bunch of people that have like because he you know he, he does a magazine he's written books he has lots of people in touch with him about it and he's had lots of people talk to him about when they've tried to heal themselves mm -hmm. so when i first spoke to him i was wasn't really on my journey into these the, you know like um spiritual spirituality psi phenomena consciousness all this kind of thing i was just I thought lucid dreaming seemed cool and so I wanted to talk to somebody about it and he started going into all of these these various areas and I was totally unprepared including healing so he's like mm. oh yeah it's possible to heal in a in a lucid it's... dream like you and I'm like okay and he's like yeah emotionally and I'm like yeah okay I get that easy that I can understand that that's not hard to wrap my head around uh spiritually and I'm like okay maybe another word for emotionally at the time you know and then physically and I was like ah oh, come on um <laughs> and obviously now like uh, a little bit further down the road I could there's healing is maybe not as simple as we are led to believe um and yeah he told me some pretty compelling stories yeah. of people that have either healed themselves or somebody else in a lucid dream yeah is, actually yeah. um it yeah so again like lucid dreaming is a is an altered state and um it's mm. like hypnosis is another way to do that to put yourself in a yeah. um and you can use it for physical healing uh, there's a lot of evidence i actually literally was looking at scientific papers last week because i was reading oh, um wow. dr andy andrew weil his I was listening to a few of his books. And uh, so I thought, what's the scientific research on this? So I went to look and mm -hmm. there's a bunch of papers showing um, medical hypnosis works for a lot of gastrointestinal issues and wound really? healing. It speeds up wound healing after surgery. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So wow. there's a lot. Your subconscious mind is extremely powerful. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. I I would I'd be keen to try, you know, some some of that like hypnosis stuff. Like I'd be tempted as well like if I had to have surgery, I'd be tempted to try the, yeah. you know, I've I've seen that on TV like sometimes the instead of an anest anesthesia they they'll have a hypnotist. Yes, they used to do that. Into an altered state. Before anesthesia was invented, they used to use hypnosis for surgeries and it yeah. worked um really well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's it's crazy um but yeah i mean again it comes back down to kind of we have the, the placebo effect which is accepted by the mainstream yeah. by society by science mm -hmm. but but it does kind of lead to a lot of this stuff i think well um yeah the placebo actually i've been well i guess because of andy weil i've been like thinking about this a lot too about the placebo I, yeah. and i've been writing about it because of psychedelics because um, well, we don't have to get too far into it, but anyway, the, yeah, Western culture and Western medicine, they just dis discard the placebo effect, but it turns out the placebo effect is everything we've been talking about. You can put yourself in an altered state. A lot of what you uh, believe, um, becomes true yeah. for your, for your mind and body, and it should be leveraged. It's not something to discard. Yeah. 
Yeah. And and I think, I mean, I don't know the exact numbers or anything, but sometimes you'll see like a, a medicine that comes through the FDA or what have you. And, and they're like, oh, it has this percentage like efficacy or I, I don't know the exit, the terminology, um, but it's, it's this effective, 30%, 25%. Yes. And then it's like, but the placebo effect is essentially the same yes. um, or slightly higher. Yeah. And it's like, okay, so, so that medicine is being pushed out despite all of its side effects and how much it's going to cost people and everything like that but at the same time you you admit in your case studies there that the the same effect was seen by the placebo yes placebo is very high actually it's 40 to 60 percent efficacy in most studies and that goes for antidepressants for behavioral health for all kind any kind of really across the board, most medications, it's placebo is 40 to 60% effective. And actually in psychiatric medicine, this is, they're like writing about it a lot is that um, the pharmaceuticals are becoming less and less effective and the placebo effect is increasing. And Mm -hmm. that's why a lot of pharmaceutical companies have moved out of doing mental health medications because it's not profitable because the placebo effect is so high. (laughs) <laughs> yeah well i just had a thought how good would it be if like um you know if, if you're not dealing with a life-threatening condition or anything like that like just uh you know a little ache and pain or a little problem um obviously we give out medication for everything these days but imagine yeah. if the patient has to sign a piece of paper saying like um i'm okay if you either give me the medication or a placebo um and and you'll discuss it with me on my follow-up appointment in three months um and imagine if all the patients did that and then we were able to you know give a massive high percentage of people placebo effect and uh, or, or, like sugar pills that's how it or, should or be not, you're not even sugar um yeah exactly i know they used like, to and then do just that. save the medication for when it's yeah. actually you know nothing nothing seems to work um oh yeah. i just want to say one more thing just because i have been writing about this and thinking about it and reading about it Please. um but they uh they actually used to do that and so one of the problems with western medicine uh, and Western science is that we reduce everything into parts and we separate everything. And that's why we're, yeah. you know, we're always trying to be like, what's the effective, um, uh, you know, exact chemical structure, the exact molecule that's effective. But um, it turns out that in nature and the universe, things are complex and they work in systems. And a lot of times they work better together. And so I, mm. the history of medicine, uh, doctors, leverage the placebo effect and like they would tell their patients you know like they would say like oh this is this is going to heal but it it would be like some inert substance but it would work um and we don't do that Mm -hmm. anymore because they think you know there's like this kind of silly narrative that it'll harm patients or oh if you can give them a treatment that will heal them you should that you know works but Mm -hmm. um that should change because and psychedelics like the research into it is kind of changing that, like, or helping us remember that you can't isolate things. Um, there is no drug. There's no mind without body. There's no drug without context. There's no, like, it's all related and it all helps you heal. Yeah. And so you should leverage each part, part of that. So hopefully we're coming back to that. Hopefully fingers yeah. crossed. <laughs> Yeah, I think, I think it's, yeah, slowly. And there's obviously a lot of hurdles with, yeah, like the, the, the fact that everything is totally driven by by profit and money yeah and that's that's why and, that's another thing is what it's like when you stop to back up and be like wait why don't we do uh why isn't there an emphasis on placebo it's because it's free <laughs> it's cause yeah, exactly you can't you can't charge people yeah. for that yeah Unless, unless there you you had people trained as you know like a kind of not a, a doctor, you come up with a new word like a placebo doctor who who stands right, there yeah. and like really like an actor like really convinces yes, the person that this like yeah. that was gonna happen. Um, but yeah, it's it's sad that, that that reality. What are your thoughts on like other types of I guess anomalous is a, a word I'll use anomalous healing like like Reiki or like the Bengston method or. Mm-hmm. Um, healing from from an nde you know because some people have an nde uh, and then yeah. and then they come back and they, they would have had xy problem like you know resolved i don't i mean i don't know i'm really fascinated by it and like i, I was thinking about um anita morjani's case yeah yeah and like how uh, it just um what's the word problematic that is for western medicine and science yeah. because it's like a right like shift like overnight like she was dying and then suddenly her there's no trace of you know the metastatic cancer in her body like what is that (laughs) um and I think that that I mean I I, I'm so interested in it I don't know anything about how it could possibly work um besides Mm. 
you know, subtle energy, which we don't know what that is. Um, you know, I don't know how it works, but it's, yeah. it's interesting. I, I mean, I do think that it goes somewhat to, if you're leaving the scientific materialist paradigm, uh, then what's your worldview? You know, some of these other worldviews uh, suggest that consciousness like is fundamental, is a fundamental energy or information field that we are a part of and that mm -hmm. um, the manifestation of it or whatever, like it's all kind of mental. So that that would explain why in our brains, it's like, oh, how could her physical body uh, flip and heal? But if you think of it in a different way of like her consciousness, flipped right like that's what happened is she went she had this yeah. nde and something happened to her her understanding mm -hmm. or whatever and she came back and she was healed then you're like oh, okay then there's something else going on so so maybe on some level the consciousness was the thing that was ill and then right like, you know what i mean not maybe not because the body was ill but there's that but, kind of yeah that yeah, correlation but it goes back right like maybe there is no separation like many mm. of the tra traditions and cultures of the world have told us there is no separation yeah. Um, and I think that that's, uh, I don't know, that's interesting. Like now I listen and I, I hear things differently now because of all, digging into all this research and stuff. Um, but yeah, people will say, oh, it was the mind and not the body. But in truth, they're not separate. The nervous mm -hmm. system, your central nervous system is connected to your immunological system, to your endocrinology. <laughs> like they're all connected. So, um, mm -hmm. and there are, there are field, uh, like a whole field called psychoneuroimmunology, psychoneuroendocrinology. And those are that study of like, if your mindset changes, if something in your mind changes, or if you go into hypnosis and think about your immune system ramping up, killing, yeah. you will actually see an effect because they're connected and you have more control than you think you do. So um, yeah. I don't know. I mean, you know, like I get, hopefully we can get some money to investigate these things. There's just not a lot of research funds There's so much to investigate and no funds yeah. in these areas it makes me think as well about like the birthmark cases in in mm -hmm. you know ian stevenson and jim tucker's work with reincarnation um and it also makes me think of like really boring everyday mundane stuff that even skeptics you know are, are fine to accept in the sense that like if i'm stressed that's going to aggravate my you know digestive issues yeah. or if if x y and z things like that but like a simple stress which is in in my mind in my brain in in something that's you know not purely physical necessarily it's um, actually it's really can have a physical effect yeah and it's funny because you're right like some people roll their eyes at that but it's like if you ask someone close your eyes you know take a few deep breaths think about something really stressful and then ask mm. them to tell you what's going on in their body like they'll tell you, yeah. you know, like my stomach, yeah. I, I'm sweating. My heart rate has just gone up. Like if they're in tune mm -hmm. with their body and it's like a simple exercise like that can just show you how your mind is connected to your body. And then suddenly have them think about something nice. Like I'm in a, where's your favorite place in the world? The beach, you know, I'm at the beach. It's a nice day. I have no worries. How does that feel? <laughs> nice. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's like, of course your mind and body are connected. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's so true. It's really fascinating. Um, I guess maybe it's a good time to ask you this question. Um, maybe it's going to be a hard one for you to to, to answer it just because like you, you'll have so many things to think, like to, to decide between. But I was going to ask, what is some of, or what are, or is, it can either be one or multiple examples, um, some of the most or the most shocking uh, data and or, you know, compelling research um, in, in any of these areas that you've come across in your career? Like what was like one maybe study or, or experiment that you were like, whoa, that one, that hits different. If there is one that jumps out, you know. Um, about any of this stuff? Yeah, yeah, like any kind of any area of, of anything that doesn't fit the mainstream paradigm, yeah. let's say for now, any of this, um, uh, I this think, stuff. You know, I think to this day, I think to this day, the mo the thing, so one of the, uh, I didn't mention this yet, but after I started reading about the past life regression literature, I started reaching out to people to interview them, scientists and stuff. And then, oh, and Winbridge Institute was one of those. And I spoke to one of the founders and he gave me this huge reading list. Mark? Uh, Mark, yeah, I spoke to Mark. And he gave me this huge reading list of, he's like, oh, there's been so much research done on this. You have a lot of catching up to do. Here you go. And <laughs> I went to read uh, the studies and the um the US government's investigation into psychic phenomena to me is still some of the most compelling evidence um, mm -hmm. because they funded it from 
NASA, from the Department of Defense, from like the Army, um, the the whatever the office I can't remember of intelligence. I don't know any, any they have too many acronyms. Um, Naval intelligence. I don't yes. know. Whatever. Yeah, they had like <laughs> a bunch of different um, branches fund it for like over 25 years and to the point where it moved from research to being operational to meaning they like uh you know understood the psychic phenomena works that like you could quote unquote whatever it's called remote view like close your eyes send your consciousness mm -hmm. somewhere else get information from like a bunker in russia <laughs> bring back the information and then give it to the military or the cia and they could use it operationally and it would work to the point where they used it in a program yeah. to me that is so compelling um i mean besides just the science which i read and which is solid or you know which has been improved upon over the years by newer researchers because it was done in like the 70s <laughs> but 70s and 80s has been improved upon but i think just that fact is uh speaks a lot to me and i spoke to mm. one of the physicists two of the physicists actually who did that program um I mean, it's pretty rock solid. It's like crazy to me that anybody thinks that it's not true. Um, but if you look into it, if you put any time and effort into it, looking yeah. into it, reading the papers, I mean, the CIA wrote a whole report on it. I know they're not necessarily trustworthy, but um, <laughs> but I read the science and it's since been replicated many times yeah. by many labs around the world. So yeah. it's pretty solid. So to me, um, that's like a pretty interesting phenomena that we may not understand, but that's well-documented, well-researched, uh, and has a lot of implications for a lot of things that we do that's not being yeah. looked at. So I think that yeah. to me is still really, I just think that's insane that we <laughs> don't pay more attention to it. Yeah, absolutely. And that's a good answer. And it's interesting, actually, that I kind of, when I kind of, uh, became aware of the reality of, of yeah, psi phenomena and that kind of thing. I managed to get there without even dipping my toe into really like the government documents and SRI and all that kind of thing. Um, so that was just kind of like this massive area that I was like, I'm just going to, you know, read these areas first and, and leave that on the side. And, and it's still there for if I need it. And, and yeah, there's so much even without it, you know, to make an amazing case. And then when you've got that as well, yeah, like, I don't know how this is not yeah. more known. I feel like it's, it's, it's actually weird to think about it. You know, it's like, it's actually strange how I got, I went through my whole life, like, well, like a, you know, 20 odd nearly 30 years or yeah 30 years um without having any awareness of it like we said at the start of our conversation that um i can't remember the word we used psychic maybe there was another word spirituality and we were talking about you know like the crystal balls and mm. and somebody trying to guess with cards and, oh, divination. and just like uh, yeah but we were just i was saying about how like my first impression of psychic stuff and spirituality was all just like you know just total nonsense and I, it's just so weird how that's still the prevailing right you know view right. view of all this when we have the, the research is there it's been done yeah. and and the, and you don't even have to go into the anecdotal stuff necessarily exactly. like there's right. all that as well there's a there's a treasure trove of that as well yeah that's true but, and when you bring it up people try to debunk it and you're like listen this is not about psychics like there's yeah <laughs> here's there's so much there's science behind it yeah yeah it's wild um Let's talk a little bit about your book. Um, so Proof of Spiritual Phenomena, uh, A Neuroscientist's Discovery of the Ineffable Mysteries of the Universe. Um, I love the title, by the way. Uh, I love the ineff yeah. Ineffable Mysteries bit particularly. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, we'll put it up on the screen as well. And we'll leave it there for a few seconds so people have time to really take it in. And in case anybody wants to get it, I'll put the link in the description below and everything like that. Um, but I was just going to ask if you can yeah, talk a little bit about the book in general, give people an idea of, you know, what's in there and why they should read it yeah. and i wanted to ask you to just kind of elaborate on the word proof um mm -hmm. and kind of what what exactly do you prove and and how mm, yeah no so i didn't choose the title so or was it a publisher's <laughs> publisher's, uh, choice. publisher's choice save us evan save us who else was yeah. it that has proof in the title it's always the publisher oh proof of um, heaven like even alexander yeah too, and yeah. there was another one as well yeah, yeah. There, there's like three i think now that i've had on the show yeah. that no, they, no it wasn't me um <laughs> So I wrote the book. So yeah, first off the bat, I, I'm a scientist never used the word proof. We never prove anything. Yeah. <laughs> so I would never have chosen that word, but they did. And Except most scientists say that this is all proven to be nonsense. That's true. Yeah, that is true. That. We do say that. Um, <laughs> but 
Well, but the book is really is is sort of my search for proof of spiritual phenomena or my search for evidence for any of this stuff. Mm -hmm. And the reason I wrote it is because it was it was the book I wish I had or like I found a lot of books on, you know, talking about the Star Stargate program or like there were a lot of books that had summarized all the research, like here's all the evidence on NDEs, here's all the evidence on reincarnation and psychic and da da da. But what I didn't find was like when you are a scientific materialist and you encounter this stuff and you start to have like an existential crisis and then an identity crisis and then your world starts to fall apart um like how do you deal with that and so yeah. um so I kind of I, the book is 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 me walking through my interaction with this and I didn't put all of the evidence that I read I basically put the big kind of pieces of evidence that really shook me. And I focused mm -hmm. on scientific peer reviewed articles that were uh, like met what we call meta analyses or reviews in science, which is when you put a bunch of yeah. studies together. So I only looked at stuff like that, or I only put those in the book because um, that's what you would do. Like if you, if I were writing a um, just normal science book, I would, look to those kinds of papers and say, look, this mm -hmm. is the, this is the summary of the field. This is where it stands. And if the summary of the field and where it stands says that it's like a solid phenomena, then it's a solid phenomena. So that's what I put in the book for. And, um, and then I kind of documented my crisis along the way. And then also how, as I started to incorporate spirituality into my day to day, how my thinking and how I, I started to change and things started to change. Um, and then I also talk a lot about science, not a lot. I talk about science and some of the problems with it, <laughs> like funding and how it's a kind mm -hmm. of a cult. Um, and uh, the other thing is when I was doing my, I was doing this interview project just for myself that turned into this book. So I was interviewing my colleagues, my scientist colleagues to be like, I can read you a quote about that if you want, because I was going to ask you oh. a question about it later. So I just about your like interview project. Mm -hmm. So you said on your website, after a series of life altering events, I started a project interviewing mystics, intuitives and scientists trying to understand the meaning of life, fate and destiny. I share the extensive research I discovered. A few casual interviews for my own edification snowballed into the most extraordinary conversations of my life. One person introduced me to the next and so on until I had found myself in the bewildering situation of speaking with high level current and former government researchers about the connections between science, spirituality, consciousness, and the nature of reality. Yes. Yeah, that's what happened. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I started this like casual project for myself, but then it it snowballed into yeah. Uh, just, yeah, people introducing me to other people. And then suddenly I was just, ta you know, talking to some of the physicists from the Stargate program, and then they introduced me to mm -hmm. other people. And um, it was really those conversations with with those people that they were the ones who really, you know, I was like over here in baby uh, spirituality psychic land. And they're the ones who <laughs> blew my world open to be like, have yeah. you ever thought about UFOs? Did you know consciousness was related? Did you know psychedelics were related to paranormal <laughs> phenomena? Like they were just every conversation. I was like, what is going on? I, they they didn't say <laughs> anything that I knew, like everything they talked about were things I never thought about or read about or heard about. And so it launched me well, you know, into a mental crisis because every day was like uh, just so much information that was um, ag against my worldview and my yeah. paradigm of belief. And then suddenly, and then that's when I had my second crisis was the identity crisis because then I felt like I had this decision point, probably one of my destiny mm. points of like, are you going to make the leap of faith uh, and keep going and keep reading and keep learning? Or are you going to get scared and stop so that you don't have to change? <laughs> um, and yeah. um, I decided to keep going, but it, but that's what I talk about in the book is I had to uh, go through a death and rebirth and a transformation and just wow. to do it because it was yeah. uh, too much information <laughs> to quietly assimilate into my former worldview. It was like a total revamp. And then um, that's, and the reason, and then it came up against my ego, right? My, I'm a scientist, I'm an expert, I'm, uh, I know everything. And it came up against yeah. those defenses that I had built and spent a lifetime building. And so that's, those started to get torn, 
tore down, then I started having a real, real crisis. <laughs> so some of that um, is talked about in the book, but it's it was all necessary and it was good to go through it and to talk about it because I think that when you, when I go out to talk to people about it now or when I encounter um, resistance, I know exactly where they're coming from, right? Like I was totally there. I was totally that person and I get it. Yeah. So you'd say spirituality in a way put you into that crisis. Mm -hmm. Did it also then, yeah, serve as the catalyst to get you out of that crisis and to like help you to, yeah, to, to reassimilate or to assimilate all of this with your, your you know, your new paradigm. And yeah. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. It feels like it kind of, yeah, it put you there <laughs> and would get you out. Of yeah. It, right? Yeah. It was, um, it, it carried me through and it was super valuable. Like I think also before this whole thing, I just thought, Oh, who needs that? You know, <laughs> who even yeah. needs spirit? Well, what is that? Why do you need that? Um, but then I realized it was valuable because, uh, and it, it just the way it reframed my thinking of like, Oh, if something happens in my, I mean, think about it, like with our current worldview, when you're, you're suffering and you just, you feel uh, more despair when you think that, your suffering is meaningless but if you mm. like for me using spirituality to re reframe it and ask what am i supposed to be learning here and even believing if it's helpful to you which sometimes it was and sometimes it wasn't to me but but even throwing the idea or the possibility into your head of oh this is for my evolution and growth um even that helps you know uh so yeah. i don't know there were a lot of things yeah along the way that that just my god like you know it'd be, uh, i think the nihilistic worldview is very bleak and there's nowhere to go from there but i think with spirituality there's at least like opportunities <laughs> and steps to come up out of the yeah. darkness it's just up to you to yeah. take them or not so yeah yeah yeah, it's 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 easy to forget how dark the yeah like the the mainstream paradigm is when you you know like death the end love yeah, meaningless yes, yes. like you're suffering meaningless <laughs> yes. nothing matters whatsoever yeah. like and yet they still manage to convince us to think everything is full of meaning like you know like the 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 people that are trying to feed us that paradigm they're also like yeah but you got to be proud about your country and everything right, at the same time you know? like yeah, and you got to yeah you got to care about your career what else is there <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly um okay so i guess let's talk a little bit about what happens after we die uh so <laughs> we did talk about you know regressions and past lives and things um which clearly gives us a clue as to your thinking on this and obviously all the other stuff we've talked about lends itself towards as I think something happening but yeah what's your take um I'm gonna go ahead and say that you you think some part of us survives but go into a little bit more detail for me if you can in terms yeah. of yeah what what survives what happens again I know we're in speculation territory now yeah, not science yes, yeah um but like it does personality survive emotions both the good and bad emotions right. like um yeah yeah we're, we're I think just your general I thoughts think, I mean I don't know like anyone else but I think so I mean I <laughs> think some part yeah. of it's gonna change. I I mean there's some some theories from science actually like um you know Irvin Laszlo and he wrote a book called Science in the Akashic Field um where he lays a scientific theory for there being something like the Akashic Field which holds everything that's ever happened in the past present and future so if everything that's ever happened every thought emotion every consciousness mm. if everything's there then yeah there is no loss of anything yeah. um so i think that there are some i mean in if people need science there are definitely theories being put forth even to support that um i think and i think from a um yeah i just think from the convergence i think of evidence from like we talked about mm -hmm. reincarnation and ndes i think they're difficult to explain without believing that something uh, whether it's consciousness or energy or information or who knows what the word is, that something yeah. um, basically weaves through, you know, time and space mm. and our lives or whatever. So, yeah, I think so. I mean, and I've also just for, you know, for fun, like, uh, okay, so I had a friend, I have some personal fun stories if you want <laughs> but I, yeah, yeah. I have a, a mentor actually my mentor and friend who 
made made me write the book. I didn't want to write a write a book and he was like oh you have these interviews you have to write a book and he's like i want to see a draft in two weeks um (laughs) he passed away from covid um two years ago two years ago wait yes two years ago (laughs) um a year and a half ago uh but i remember when he uh passed away i immediately um was in meditation one morning and i thought I I thought I'll ask for a sign so I um mm-hmm. oh and Laura Lynn Jackson has a great book on this called I think it's called signs and signs yes the the, the language the secret language of the universe yes. I'm actually in the middle of reading it right oh, now have, yeah um, I always send it to people <laughs> who've lost someone because it's such a yeah. such a beautiful book so you know yeah. she says you can choose any sign so I was meditating and I thought what what should I ask like give me a sign that I should ask Jeff for a sign <laughs> which is like, I couldn't think of one. So I had this image of a, um, a T-Rex, like that. <laughs> uh, yeah. a T-Rex holding a ball. And okay. so I was like, okay, that's my sign and whatever. And then I don't know if it was that night or the next night, but I went to a craft store. It was like around Christmas. I went to a craft store with some friends to buy some Christmas decorations. And one of my friends picked up this or um like I, I don't, why am I looking like I have it out it's not Christmas um yeah. but it's like this wooden um carving whatever and she's like Mona look this is so cute and I looked and it was a t-rex holding an ornament and wow. I, I'm getting emotional but I just started like crying because I was like oh my god <laughs> like it was so yeah. crazy um because it wasn't it also wasn't like I saw it Right. Like I wasn't looking for it in the um, store. My friend like picked it up and gave it to me. So and you hadn't told your friend about the. Uh-huh. the no. no. So I started. And, and how long was it after you asked for it as well? So it was like, it was like two days. It was like a day or it was maybe wow. that morning yeah. or maybe the next day, but wow, it was really powerful. And I like started crying and she's like, Oh, what's wrong? Sorry. <laughs> it's like, I thought you would think it's cute. And I was like, no, no, no. I, I like, I asked my friend for a sign. <laughs> And it was that. And so it was crazy. And I like had a bunch of other things like that with him. Um, like I yeah. asked for, uh, I joked with him. I was like, oh, now you can send me a million dollars. And then I went for a run and I do this run. I've done this run for years. It's the same path. Um, like I, I, so well, I would know it so well. Um, and then I found $10 on the, on the ground that day, which I was like, I'm going to take that as a sign. Yeah, um, yeah. But yeah, that had a bunch of moments like that. And then also I have a friend who's very, very intuitive and very connected. And uh, later that month, he came over for dinner and he didn't know that my friend had passed away. I don't think I had even told him and I he, he didn't know him. Um, so he, but he started telling, he's like, he's really connected. So he was like, I don't mean to freak you out, but he's like, there's a spirit here for you and like it's a male and then he just started saying like a lot because he was kind of not channeling but like he was just giving me the information really quickly and it was my friend and he was saying a lot of things that only my friend could have known like so he just started it was like overwhelming so I don't know so I've had a lot of personal experiences like that now where it's like you can't really I you know I mean Sometimes I'm like, maybe the universe is responding, but, and it's not their consciousness, but either way it's magical. Right. And yeah, full of meaning, either way so. it shows that, that there's more to it than, yeah. than, yeah, than, than what we, we used to think. Um, but yeah, that's, that's awesome. I could listen to those kind of stories all day. I, it's great. I haven't really had anything myself, like as strong as that, you know, like, uh, not yet, hopefully, uh, hopefully, you know, next time we talk, I'll be telling you about like my amazing, uh, communication, but, um, but yeah, that's really, that's really amazing. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Are there any, are there any others that you want to share before we kind of, uh, move on a little bit? Um, I think those are the best ones. Uh, that's all I can think of right now. Yeah. Yeah. No worries. No worries. Um, but yeah, that, that is really awesome. Have you ever had any other, like you mentioned earlier, precognitive dreams, this is after death communications. What other kind of experiences, anomalous, psi related experiences have you had? Don't necessarily have to go into the stories. I'm just interested to yeah. Yeah, see what kind of breadth of experience. Yeah. I mean, a lot of precognitive dreams, a lot of times they're just mundane 
uh, yeah, thing. they often are with people, yeah. aren't they? Yeah, I, um, I've heard that before. I think before my friend passed, actually, I I had a feeling somebody was going to die. Um, really? And yeah, and I like, again, on that run, which is this like route I take, I guess is pretty significant. But like, I, um, I was running and I have this kind of... Uh, Oh, it's like, I, I like to keep something secret. So I have this insect, I don't say which one, but I have an insect that I have yeah, a yes. connection to. And um, mm. it's a kind of a rarer one, I guess, for in our area. And so I went for yeah. a run and that week before he passed away, um, there was, uh, that insect was on the sidewalk dead, but it was like a really mm. big version of it. And it was like broken and oh, basically it was like a really gruesome death. And I was running and I stopped in my tracks and like, I was overcome with emotion and like, I actually had tears in my eyes and I just knew that I was going to get bad news. And it was so weird. And I texted my friend even and took a picture of it. And I was like, I have a bad feeling. And she was like, don't worry, just go like enjoy your run or whatever. But, um, so I've had moments like that where I, I'm not totally clear on what the message is. I've just <laughs> like, I'll get, yeah. like, I'll know generally something is going to happen, but I won't know what it is. Yeah. Um, I think those are, uh, I've had a lot of, like, I'll say something or when I'm talking to someone, I won't know why, but I'll start talking about something. And then suddenly they'll be like, oh, that's so weird that you meant, you know, like, oh, or I'll have like a story that I think I should tell them. And then I do. And then they're like, oh, I really needed that exact mm. thing or, and it'll be something I don't usually talk about. So it's things that, oh, and dreams. Like I've had, this happens a lot when I'm like traveling with people, I'll have dreams and it's related to the their lives. <laughs> so I'll tell, oh, really? yeah, so I'll wake up in the morning, I'll be like, I had this really weird dream and then I'll start explaining it and then they'll just be staring at me like, uh, <laughs> they're like, <laughs> why have you been reading my yeah, diary? Yeah, they're like, that's exactly what's going on in my life right now. <laughs> so yeah. that kind of thing that is interesting yeah wow that's it just all yeah it's just all kind of adds to this like that we're all connected and that that we're yeah. all kind of linked into this same i don't know field of consciousness again i'm sure i'm way off with my wording and, and who knows exactly what is happening um which I guess leads me to a it leads me quite nicely to to another question, um, which this is the one I was going to ask you after reading the quote about your interviews that you did with people where it kind of snowballed and and you just were yeah asking these profound questions. So what is like at the moment, what is your best response to the question? What is the nature of reality? Um. Oh, and obviously this is one that you could research these topics for a hundred years yeah. on, on your deathbed. You're still not going to have a proper, you know, we're never going to be able to yeah. really unravel this, but um, yeah. I mean, I do. One thing I know, I think with conviction is that the universe is a mirror. I do really believe that. And um, so I do believe that it mirrors back to us Um our states. So I, I don't know exactly how, of course, I don't know any of the mechanisms, whatever, we can all speculate. But I do think there's no um, separation as much as we think between mind and matter or external and internal, and that yeah. and that the universe is a mirror. And so that a lot of the experiences and things that you get, like put in front of you are are mirrors of what, you know, um, yeah or put, and, and i and i actually also think that its goal what or one of the goals is is like self-actualization and like of the universe through us so because it's kind of like oh why yeah. would it be a mirror but it's like yeah the it mirrors so that you can grow right grow towards mm -hmm. evolution grow towards complexity grow towards wholeness um so i think that's the point of that right is like because i think yeah. that's that was my second question of like i do know almost for a fact that the universe is like a mirror and that the question would be why and it's that it you know keeps mirroring things back to you so that you can get to where you want to go or you know evolve to the best version of yourself mm -hmm. and since we are all connected um as a part of a whole in the universe that means that we're all trying to get the universe into the best state or the best evolutionary state yeah. or place it wants to go yeah. So in essence, then it's like, I think I don't know the, the law of attraction very well, but that's the idea with that, I think, is that you, you, you put up positive vibes and the universe is going to 
give you good vibes back but i don't know if that's correct in in for the um, law of attraction but that's yeah. what you're basically saying right is if you're in a positive you know mindset and and put positivity out there then positive yeah. things uh, yeah. are going to not exactly i'm well, kind of no, no that's <laughs> that's true but what i don't like about the the whole positivity thing is cuz like and uh-huh. we talked about in this um conversation uh the importance of like emotional catharsis and healing so i do think so long as people don't avoid negative emotions or suppress them because that just makes you unhealthy and that does not help you evolve and grow like you're supposed to face those things and but and that's the other thing when you suppress emotions they will just keep being mirrored back to you by the universe until you face it and let it go because you just hold the energy inside of you and this is known in psychology like um this is not like a necessarily a metaphysical thing but you you're basically your behaviors keep uh repeating themselves and you know you you every time you interact with someone they interact back with you in a certain way so you keep attracting back into your life the things that you haven't resolved so um the only problem with I, I agree. I think the law of attraction, I, whatever you want to call it, I think that that I don't, works. I don't know. I think it works. That. No, I, I think it totally it. Yeah. works. I'm just, so I mm-hmm. think that um, sometimes people only focus on that and then they're like, oh, I have to be positive all the time. But if you right. do that and you ignore the negativity in you or the emotions or the trauma, you're mm. you're never, you're, you're like, it's not going to work or it might work, but it, it won't work the way you want. Um, because yeah, the universe is just going to keep giving you things to, for you to release that, energy that emotional energy so but yes i think that um you can consciously definitely try to be positive i mean it there's in holistic medicine you know that's one of the the, same in the other way around as well i suppose like if you're if you're living every day negative you're in that kind of like downward spiral kind of you know everything is bad and dark and the universe could kind of yeah yeah yeah. (laughs) for sure how do you think we can deal with that then have you got any obviously there's like a million ways but have you got any advice for people that need to yeah like deal with those negative aspects in order for them to embrace you know the positivity out there and i think that um i think that emotions Unfortunately, in our culture, we don't learn how to deal with them constructively, and we don't no. uh, learn the importance of releasing them. And so I think that the most important thing that you can do for yourself is finding ways to release your emotions in a constructive and safe way so that you don't end up like lashing out at people <laughs> or um, crying hysterically when you finally have the opportunity to release. So, I mean, one way you could do that is if you're angry, you know, hit a pillow, throw a pillow, scream into a pillow. Um, if you're sad, uh, find a safe, you know, watch a sad movie and let those emotions out. Um, and then don't wallow in them, right? Like have it kind of think of it as like this an emotional release valve like let it go mm-hmm. and then you go try to do something that you love like taking a walk on the beach or riding a horse or playing a sport yeah. or listening to music or talking to someone you love um so yeah. i think it's um really important to find constructive ways to release your emotions and then um find ways to connect with people and do things that you enjoy and you can think of it literally i mean i do sometimes think of it in like physiological and chemical terms so it's like okay let me get rid of some of these uh heavier negative energies emotions or chemicals if you want to think of it that way um and then let me fill up on on good stuff so yeah i think and i think it's different for everyone right but or getting a massage like it's a really insightful way of thinking about it though sorry please carry on yeah um so yeah, and the other thing is sometimes it can be hard to mentally you're you know you're kind of like oh I have to be positive like that can be hard when you're not in a good state of uh or in a good state so that's mm. why sometimes something with your body like dancing or massage uh getting um, like even if it's self massage or stretching anything to move your body to is physiological and, and releases feel good hormones so sometimes if you're mentally like i can't get there like i just can't i'm in a bad like try to just do something with your body that'll make you feel good mm-hmm. yeah 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 that's really really insightful actually like um the idea of yeah if you have a if something happens and you're really sad or angry as you said those were the two emotions you used um I'm I'm picturing in my head as like you know like a a petrol tank a gas tank filling up with your sadness or with your anger like yeah and it's not you don't just leave that and and try and like 
make your peace with it and you find an outlet mm-hmm. you find a way to empty it and then you put some good stuff in like it's, it's yeah it's nice it's a yeah, nice yeah. way of thinking about it um and yeah, yeah when you do you it that. over time over and over again it just becomes natural and you'll know you'll start recognizing like oh i feel like something is not right and and then you need to you're like let me you know feel into it or how do, how do I want to, what emotion is this? Sometimes it's hard for people to I, connect with their bodies and identify emotions. So another thing I recommend mm-hmm. is um, there's actually something called the wheel of emotion. Like you can Google it. <laughs> so um, it helps you identify emotions more easily. Like there's a list of them. Cause sometimes yeah. I feel like I don't even, I'm like, I don't know what I'm feeling, but if you can see a <laughs> list of words, but I'm feeling a yeah, lot, like I'm feeling yeah. a lot, but if you can see a list of words, then it helps, you know, then you yeah. can start to be like, yeah. no, I'm not this i'm not you know but i'm yeah i'm frustrated you know or something yeah yeah because we're more nuanced than emojis there's yeah. more emotions than than <laughs> like uh the faces on our little keyboards yeah, yeah. Uh, no that's that's really cool um so yeah i guess um yeah to move on to psychedelics um can can you talk a little bit about where psychedelics sit in relation to you know consciousness spirituality and and science yeah psychedelics are interesting so i think i mentioned like when i was doing the interviews somebody mentioned it to me they're like oh did you know that a, a paranormal stuff can happen on psychedelics and so i thought oh mm. interesting so i went to do research on <laughs> psychedelics which i was not interested in at all um and they were right so there was like this but then what was also interesting was that they were extremely therapeutic. It turned out like in the 50s, 1950s to 1970s, before they were banned, they were used by um, psychiatrists, particularly LSD, and I think some psilocybin, but um, were used by psychiatrists to deal with people's issues because of what I mentioned earlier, when you go into an altered state, even with psychedelics, it kind of gets your ego defenses out of the way and opens up your subconscious. So the issues that you normally avoid during normal everyday consciousness suddenly rise up and you can resolve them. So um, they were working on that, then it got banned, then there was not a lot of research. And now they're doing research again on like using MDMA for PTSD, psilocybin for depression and various things. And then the, I think in the fifties, the sixties, they were um, documenting, there was some, I was looking into, there's, Well, in indigenous cultures, for sure. So basically like Mm -hmm. in uh, cultures that have shamans and like that kind of um, indigenous knowledge, they use like psychoactive or mind altering uh, plants on purpose for spiritual reasons. So like the shaman will take them, they'll go into this altered space, this hyperspace, these other, whatever you want to call it, psychic space. And they can see clearly like the person's problems, whether it's spiritual or how to heal them, um, or they might be able to look into their their future. Um, So they explicitly use it for those reasons. Like, and there's no controversy about that in those cultures. Uh, And then in Western culture, when these um, plants or drugs, whatever you want to call them, were coming to the cultural consciousness. Um, there was some exploration of this by like, um, what's his name? Andrea Puhrich and Gordon Wasson. Um, they did a little bit of experimentation, nothing like no, not big studies, but just kind of seeing like, oh, if you take psilocybin, like, can you, does your psychic uh, phenomena, like your ability on ESP tests, it, in, um, mm-hmm. improve and the, yeah. I, anecdotally they said it did but you know who knows but um not good studies but yeah so there's so there's <laughs> but there's yeah so there's a lot of anecdotal uh reports about like telepathy feeling other people's emotions seeing um the, you know uh, get basically having knowledge about future events and then seeing spirits which of course is very like on ayahuasca is reported a lot So there's a lot of that kind of paranormal thing. And then therapeutically, they're very, um, they're, they're very therapeutic. Obviously they have their dangers as well. Mm, Yeah. But obviously the more research that can be done, the more we can learn about, yeah, the dangers, the therapeutic benefits. And I suppose that you would say that's going to continue to accelerate. Like the the amount of research. Oh my goodness. It's blowing up. I just went to the psychedelic science conference in Denver from maps and it was like 12,000 people. And it was um, such a mix. It was like business people, scientists, like the burning man (laughs) audience. It was (laughs) wild. Um, 
yeah, there's yeah. Being, a lot of money being poured in, a lot of new research centers opening, a lot of new companies being built. And uh, I mean, I think it's great. I think that I think that they're they're yeah. powerful healing agents. And I do think they're a bridge between they tie together mind, body and spirit. Um, they kind of and I they're breaking the scientific paradigm in a lot of ways. I was and I'm writing about this. I write a newsletter on psychedelics and altered states, and I've been writing about this the last couple of months of like ways that they are making us rethink the way that we do science, like the way that we do the ways that we rely on double blind clinical trials or the ways that we separate yeah. mind and body and treatment from context. So, yeah, I think they're great. It's a renaissance and hopefully it'll just keep uh, expanding. Yeah. Well, maybe if we talk again in the future, we can kind of go in a little bit more detail and, and talk yeah. about it a bit more. But I think in some parts of America, they are trialing or, or maybe beyond trialing, but they're using it now for medicinal purposes. I think you can get an appointment with a doctor or whatever. So, and, and... Yeah. In America, ketamine is approved for, I think. the. I'm, I was thinking psilocybin. Is that not as also? Not yet. So not yet? MDMA okay. is going to be approved by the FDA next year wow. for PTSD. Yeah. And then after that really? will be psilocybin, hopefully. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's just, it's a crazy time to be alive, you know, yeah. where like in a lot of ways, you know, America is, or the US has, yeah, a lot of issues. But then they, on this front, it's doing in, it like, you know, it's it's a, at the forefront. And then you've got the UK who like, you know, psilocybin is still like a class A drug, you know, you know years in jail or whatever, just for yeah. like tr well, trying to use it. And it's, it's still, so here it's, yeah, that's funny, but it is, it is still federal At the federal legal. level, it's still, and, yeah. And some, many of the states are, Maybe that's what you're referring to. Many of the straight states are legalizing or decriminalizing, which means they won't make mm. it a priority to like arrest you. Right. So yeah, a lot of states are doing that. Um, but the medical track is 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 still uh, close yeah. to approval, but not fully there. Yeah, I think the UK's official stance on I, I'm I'm almost certain it's the same for psilocybin. I'm, I, it's like it was this for for weed as well for cannabis. Mm. It, they they maintain that it has no medicinal value, right. like no redeeming feature, and it's like it's so infuriating. Yes. They fired their own like scientists years ago because they came out and said it, it well, yeah, weed and, and other things are way less harmful than alcohol right. and and cigarettes and and yeah. uh, it just makes no sense. Yes. It's not policy. It's 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 just based on yeah. It's politics, obviously. As it comes, money, money, politics, mm -hmm. power. Yeah, it comes back to all that, like uh, probably being lobbied by the tobacco giants. And, <laughs> And, you know, and probably pharmaceutical giants as well, because obviously cannabis and, and psilocybin can help a lot of mm -hmm. lot of ailments. Um, yeah. Absolutely. And and alcohol too. people. They want it. They want people to still buy alcohol because uh, they don't want them to have their fun somewhere else. Right. Um, anyway, <laughs> we that's another rabbit hole going down there, <laughs> the, the, the rabbit hole of corruption. Um, what do you think needs to change uh, in order for us to accept a post-materialist paradigm? And by us, I mean, like, yes, society, the media, the masses. Mm, yeah, I mean, I do think that there needs to be a, some sort of, like, bridge. And I think, like I said, psychedelics is sort of doing that. So I, I do mm -hmm. think that that's already happening so and I, I sorry not to plug my work all the time but I was writing about this this year earlier in my newsletter because we yeah. were uh, thinking about how or I was doing research I was talking with some other researchers about how there's been more spiritual awakenings than ever before like there's been mm -hmm. some surveys showing that um and then with the psychedelic renaissance um there were some new studies that came out that showed that if you um Basically, if you take a psychedelic, you're more likely to adopt non-physicalist beliefs, which is a lot of what mm -hmm. we've been talking about here today. So believing consciousness survives death, believing spirits yeah. exist, believing uh, plants of consciousness or, you know, consciousness is fundamental. So uh, on psychedelics, you can have that experience, right? You're like, oh, everything's connected and everything's conscious. And then you meet a spirit or an entity, you know, like you have the craziest experiences. Mm -hmm. So people who have this take psychedelics are more likely to have to change their metaphysical beliefs in the direction of being non-physicalist. And that is hugely significant, mm -hmm. um, especially since they're going to be like in the U S FDA approved and prescribed for like depression. It's basically a yeah. whole population of people who would never have done psychedelics um, and who probably come from like, you know, I don't know, 
the small rural communities in America who, you know, more conservative traditional values are going to have these experiences. And you're like, oh, are you going to come out of the this this experience telling your church neighbors that plants of consciousness like i'm interested to see what's going to happen <laughs> um yeah. but i think that that is going to start happening and what's going to be the result of that we don't know but i so i think yeah. that with the psychedelic renaissance i think we'll already start to see that um and i think like some of what i was talking about too about us looking at our scientific processes and assumptions is already starting to happen with psychedelics so um i think I think that's already happening. Um, I also think, so like uh, me and a collaborator are also trying to make it more acceptable <laughs> for us to talk about these things. So like last year, and we're doing it again this year at our annual neuroscience conference, we had last year, we had a neuroscience and spirituality social. And this year we're doing a panel on alternative models of consciousness. And we're going to invite some of the big cool. neuroscientists who actually have alternative models like Donald Hoffman um, mm. and uh, the other ones we're confirming right now. Hammeroff, Stuart Hammeroff, maybe? Uh, uh, carry on, I, please. I, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm going to Stuart Hammeroff's conference this weekend, actually, in San Diego, oh, nice. in Tinos. But no. So yeah, so we're trying to do that to, I think, because part of the answer to your question is um, there's a lot of stigma. You know, scientists are afraid to talk about this stuff. I do think it's changing a little bit. But like I said, we're trying to make it a little more in numbers, right? There's strength in numbers. Yeah. So there's been a few yeah. organizations, um, like we started one based on our, uh, and then we've joined another one that has like 600 scientists and scholars and physicians, mm -hmm. um, but there's strength in numbers. So there's, there's a movement yeah. to kind of consolidate and be like, hey guys, like we should talk about this <laughs> more openly <laughs> and we should probably study this and we should probably not um pathologize people who have these experiences because you know it's part of the human experience so there is a movement and i just think there needs to be more of that um and more science too like unfortunately like we talked about a, some the only thing that will move scientists is science and personal experience but um like i needed both and so i think a lot of scientists will need both and so uh yeah. i you know, I wish there was more funding for this kind of work. Yeah, absolutely. Well, hopefully that that's going to come. It's all going to be like a yeah cycle, isn't it? That as more people become aware and and as we continue to talk about it, there's going to be yeah more people looking into it, having experiences. Funding's going to yeah become yeah, available. I, I hope yeah. and and believe. Yeah, I think it was Ed Kelly that told me he looked into like all the funding for like um sci uh, studies for the you know I don't know like ever maybe maybe in like the last 50 years something crazy and he said that it's less it's less than like one jet of the american yeah, military budget basically sad. um yeah 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 it's really sad and and yeah scary in a way um is there any just if you can answer this one in like one minute yeah. like have you got any kind of advice for people that would like to have more of these kind of experiences and and maybe be more in touch with their like intuition and that kind of thing because yeah. then i have one or two more questions to get through in like four minutes so if this this one in one um, minute if you can one, yeah <laughs> but, uh, i mean altered states just altered states get you there yeah. uh, meditation um hypnosis relaxation uh literally that will help um spiritual practices of any kind i think um, but definitely non-dual yeah. states is what they're called mm -hmm. states okay yeah yeah quieting the mind and all mm -hmm. of that um so ufos let's just really quickly um what are your thoughts on the ufo phenomenon do you keep updated like at all do you follow it are you interested in it um, are you yeah, yeah i what's your <laughs> i mean i guess i'm somewhat now i was never oh my gosh I, there's no faster way to get me to zone out of a conversation <laughs> in the past than bringing up ufos <laughs> i'm not you know i mean i didn't think it were it was interesting because i thought um because to me the odds were that there was that there is other life like I was like how is that interesting of course there is like to me it was actually that was my tip my stance but again when I spoke mm -hmm. to these people when I did my project um they're the ones yeah. who mentioned they're like no like there's a connection with consciousness like it's really interesting and um yeah I've been listening actually I just listened to, listened to Jacques Vallée's The Invisible College 
and uh, following Diana P Pasolka's work. Um, and mm -hmm. I, Jeff Kripal endorsed my book. So I follow yeah. everything he does. I mean, talk to him. I love him. Um, so, you know, I think that there's a lot there. I think it's connected to spirituality. I think it's connected to consciousness. I think it's all connected. And I, actually, so I think in addition to people having more spiritual awakenings than ever and us having a psychedelic renaissance, the third leg of, I would say, ontological shock that is going to hit our society uh if it continues at this rate is this is um mm. uh, non-human entities yeah. and our intelligence knowledge of it but yeah. possibly interactions with such things <laughs> yeah yeah that's going to be a, a real mind blow mm -hmm. i think uh potentially i again you're, you're right like there's so much we don't know about it but there's uh yeah yeah, you gave a pretty good answer, really. Um, was it was it um, Hal Puthoff that you spoke to, and and Ed May, yeah. or was it somebody Hal else? And Ed May. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. They, I would love to talk to to, to Hal Puthoff. Ed, hopefully, he's going to come on this show at some point, okay. but haven't made it happen yet. But Hal, uh, yeah, I haven't got close he's, yet. He's, yeah. <laughs> Maybe one day. He's, he's busy <laughs> doing other stuff, actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Okay, so I guess the last thing I want to ask you before I just kind of ask you for some last words would just be other than your own book, which obviously we recommend people read and, and they can find in the description. Um, are there a couple of books that you would, you know, off the top of your head that you would say, oh, read this, read that? Um, if you're interested in past life regression, anything by Brian Weiss. And if it, you want a more academic one, um, Other Lives, Other Selves by Roger Wolger. And then if you want something that's more academic, but that looks at, um, I mean, more like evidence-based, but that looks at mind and brain, I would say Transcendent mm -hmm. Mind by um, Julia Mossbridge and Iman Sparus. Okay. And uh, if you want something like psychedelic, Delic or consciousness. I love um, Food of the Gods by Terence McKenna. Um, cool. And I, oh, anything, <laughs> by, anything by Jeff Kripal. Um, if you're a scientist, The Flip by Jeff Kripal is amazing. Um, and his book on Esalen, which I'm reading right now, is fantastic and talks a lot about mind, body, um, spirit. And yeah. Awesome. <laughs> Perfect. Well, this is this has been amazing. I've I've loved it, Mona. Thank you so much for your time and for sharing all of your experiences. Before I do let you go, can you just yeah, have you got any kind of last words or a message you want to leave with people that have watched or listened? It can be anything that you want to say. Um yeah, just no stay pressure. radically curious, as I say on my website. Uh and just nice. what we talked about. Like I encourage people to get in touch with their emotions, release their emotions, and then get into altered states to uh get in touch with the spiritual and the mystical. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you again. I really appreciate it and, and I hope we can do it again sometime. Um yeah, wish you all my best. Thank you so much for having me. It was a delight. Thank you to Mona Sabani for talking with me. Thank you for listening to us and thank you to our patrons for helping to make it happen. I hope you enjoyed the conversation and gained some new insights. Please see the description for links and more. If you want to unravel the universe with us, please subscribe. And if you want to help us keep making content, please consider contributing via Patreon. Thank you.